house so make sure you watch you watch out for a uh, insurrection it's, it's, it's going to be a doozy um and with that in mind and that seems to be you know mine and keith's passion is to uh talk about uh the idea of a revolution and needing change in education uh keith brings back brings up a really interesting current event topic that happened in education this week and i'm gonna let him kind of start the ball rolling with that keith Thanks, Rob. Um, and yeah, the book's available now. Go to katiereves.com. If you're an educator right now, you've probably seen in the news this story about the officer in South Carolina um, who was called to the classroom by a teacher and that teacher's colleague when, and I am paraphrasing here, but I've read a bunch of news reports on it. I think we've put together at least the basics of what happened. The child had a cell phone and the child was instructed to either um, put away or surrender the phone, refuse to do so, and then refuse to leave the environment. It sounds like the student in question was being what once upon a time might have been labeled intransigent, but at the very least, let's just say not cooperative. I'm sure you've seen the video by now. And I, I kind of want to work this backward. It, this, this, this sort of thing is nauseating and infuriating, I think, to, to any serious educator. Anybody that loves children can't stand to see a kid treated this way. So I'm going to lay out a couple of my things, and we'll work back from there. One, there's absolutely no justification for violence against children, period, end of discussion. And I've had a conversation with colleagues. They're like, well, if a kid hits you, you're not going to hit him back. A, you're psychotic. B, I'm fired. And C, no. It's not in my genetic makeup to hit a kid. Like, what is wrong with you? There's no justification for that. Let's step, and, and to tack onto that, there are ways to safely, physically handle children who are in crisis. We get trained on these things. We professional educators take things like helping hands very seriously because we don't want to hurt a kid. Yeah, there's a difference. I have a colleague here at Yorktown who calls me mama bear because nobody screws with my cubs. There's a difference between being a mama bear and protecting your cubs and what we saw, right? So that's that. Step back from that. Children don't learn things they don't want to learn. I don't care if anybody doesn't like it. I believe that's a neuropsychological truism. I write about this in the book. If it's not relevant to a kid, you can't order a child to be interested in a thing. Anybody who has kids knows that, let alone anybody that works with them. So this, I'm going to tell you what to do, punitive, instructive, I'm going to berate you into compliance thing, I, don't, I think is a non-starter from a child development and child nature perspective. But, Take it one step further back than that, which is kind of the thing that is stuck in my craw right now. Who gives a crap if a kid has a cell phone and, and doesn't want to stand up or doesn't? Just let the kid sit there quietly. Deal with it later. You took a what they're calling a disruptive kid for noncompliance and turned it into no national story, a, a officer and uh, career ending situation, which frankly, if that was the guy's inclination, I think he probably should have lost his job. Uh, but we've now made this national massive thing because of what? I mean, say it out loud and th hear the absurdity in it. A young lady got tackled to the ground in her desk because she didn't want to give up her cell phone. How psychotic have we gotten at this point? And if you take the whole thing in the continuum from the extreme of what happened all the way back to the original thinking, I think my fundamental problem is that we tell kids to do things that is unreasonable to tell them to do. We don't think about the reasons why. We don't think about the ramifications of what we do. And quite frankly, I'm kind of ticked off about it. Rob? I, I, I always caution my own thinking whenever I look at a situation like this because we don't know the whole story. So, so we don't know, let's say, nine weeks back of what's been going on with this child, with this classroom, or anything of that nature. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that I know the history. However, with that being said, once again, to, to reiterate Keith, there is no acceptance of that violent act. Uh, we are trained. It's called CPI training on how to deal with a child. Um, I'm shocked that a resource officer wouldn't have that training, so I would imagine that he probably had some sort of training. And I venture a guess that he's just a violent man, and that's the way he reacted, and now he's paying for it. So I, I will in no way excuse uh, the school resource officer's uh, actions because they were unacceptable. Um, with that being said, I, I think we do have to start looking at um, what do we do about a non-compliant child. Um, the thing that blows my mind in terms of the minuteness of these issues is um, what about all the other kids in that room? Um, 
yes, you have a non-compliant child, and that child sitting at the desk. And the article that I read said that uh, the assistant principal, the head principal, the counselor, there are like a ton of people that came mm -hmm. and tried to get this kid to move, and the child still refused. And then ultimately, they called the resource officer. Didn't anybody think at any given point in time that maybe instead of all of those disruptions of all of those adults and eventually the school resource officer coming in and everything happening, why wouldn't they have evacuated that room and started teaching those kids somewhere else? I mean, that just seems like 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 a like a administration 101 to me. Okay, if you have an issue, you got two options. Ignore the child until the class is over, then you have an empty room and you could deal with it, or empty the room and then you can deal with it. But who in the right mind thinks this is a good idea to do this in front of all those kids in that classroom? I mean, that's just absurd. Um, and, and then again, you know, with the non-compliance of a cell phone, I, I don't know what the situation was and why the child is being non-compliant. Um, there, there are better ways to handle that, <laughs> obviously. And, and my biggest pet peeve is why would you even think about letting those other kids watch that experience? Yeah. Back to you, buddy. I completely agree with you. I mean, the, there's there's damage been done to the, to the kid in question. There's damage been done to the other kids. There's been massive damage done to the teacher's reputation, the administration's reputation. There would, there would be, even if the officer hadn't been violent, all of his credibility is out the window. There was no interest in saving face for anybody in that situation. So you're only gonna escalate it further with a kid who has decided like, no, I'm gonna sit here basically a form of protest. You can't uproot a kid in that situation without talking to them and relating to them. They're only going to dig in more. Again, we you, you mentioned exactly right. It's admin 101 and the child psych 101 element is if a kid's decided to dig in their heels, you don't give them a reason to dig in their heels further. It's just, have these people never taught a day in their life? I, re I really, it, it's very, very frustrating to me. Um, you know, from you're, it is a, a valid question. Like, what do you do in a situation with noncompliance? And because I tend to be radical, I really want to dig down to the rootmost stuff. Because we haven't had the insurrection yet. Because we haven't had the revolution. You know, for me, I, I want to go all the way to the end, and I say, well compelling students to be in learning environments where they don't want to be or they're not prepared to be either on that day or in any given situation. They're not relating to the teacher. They don't relate to the material. We haven't solved those problems. So we are constantly creating a crucible of potential intransigence. We are constantly putting kids into setting them up for failure in situations like that. You put a kid who doesn't have any relevant interest in the subject material at hand, pair them with a teacher who's done nothing to go to where they are, who's going to teach the way that they teach, and then expect it's all going to work out. Of course it's not. Part of it is administrative and, and systemic that we continue to create these situations in the American public school system to begin with. But practically, for what we have now, like you said, what do you do with, with this situation? Evacuating the room might be extreme, but it's certainly preferable to what happened. But why not de-escalate? Why not take a moment, pivot, you know, figure out what you can do to get, occupy those other kids? There are clearly other adults involved. Instead of bringing them in to attack the kid or attack the problem that the kid has, whatever may have happened, because you're right, we don't know the specifics beyond what we see on the video. Why not say, could you intervene? Could you find a kid, a relationship that that kid can latch on to and try to de-escalate? What is the real problem here? The, like the idea that a kid is just like, I'm going to use my cell phone for the sake of using my cell phone. There's always an underlying root cause. What is it that's going on here? Why are we not taking the time? And this is one of the fundamental premises in section one of friggin' insurrection. Misidentifying, misunderstanding the child, right? It's a kid. This is a child. This is a person who has feelings, thoughts, and compulsions, who has motivations and drives. What's going on? It's not appropriate for an adult to say, you'll comply with me for the sake of compliance. No, we wouldn't respond to that. Somebody stands up, they come to our office and say, you're going to do what I told you to. You're going to have to relate to me as a human being if you want me to do what you want me to do. Why would we not extend the same dignity to the kid? I just don't get it. And, and not only that, Keith, but, but, but you hit a really, uh, you hit a chord with me there, buddy. Um, and, and, and the reason is because I've been doing, uh, working on this new presentation dealing with 21st century skills and looking into the future and all that kind of stuff. You know, the idea of being uber compliant is, is very 20th century. Yeah. I mean, we, we want kids to 
to be more uh, independent problem solvers, thinking outside the box. And so, so, so when we even try to, to, to go back to that industrial age revolution look of the classroom where you sit, I talk, you listen, I think we're going to get more and more of the kids saying, but wait, that's not me. And, and, and sometimes the only way some kids know how to, to voice or, or, or not voice their, their, their frustration with the lack of education going on is to become non-compliant. Not that I, not that I agree with, with the child's uh, behavior. There might be other ways you could do it. But I think we're setting these kids up, like you said, for a situation where we're preaching. We want them to be these outside, way out thinkers to get you know these great problems solved and whatnot. But yet we're asking them to stay silent. Don't touch your cell phone. Don't move. So yeah, such a disconnect, right? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when we say you know, for we, revolutionaries want to empower children, traditionalists want to control children. Screw control. We've had enough of that enough of control mechanism, enough of you're going to do what I what I tell you to do because I tell you to do it. That isn't how the world works. And it bothers the crap out of me. I mean, I have some brilliant colleagues who will say things like, well, you have to do what you're told all the time. That's how the world works. No, it's not. That's literally not the American tradition. That's not what the nation was founded on. I know that the uh, people who are running for the president right now don't seem to know what the actual founding fathers said and continue to <laughs> conflate what they actually <laughs> wrote down and articulated. But the national tradition that we come from is not one of blind compliance. Yes, there are rules, but if you're willing to accept the consequences that go along with non-compliance, that's part of our grandest tradition of individual freedoms. That's the stuff that's constitutional in nature. It doesn't seem to be what people think our society should be about and that to me is a is a really gross disconnect I, I don't I don't empathize with it I don't like it I don't think it's good for kids it's certainly not good for adults and frankly I'm not gonna be compliant either I'm not gonna sit down and do what I'm told I'm not gonna blindly fill out my Swabot lesson plan and cram it forward and just stick to Madeline Hunter if that's what I'm sorry I'm a teacher I don't have time for blind compliance I don't have a class I have 30 individual thinking feeling uh, valuable innately human uh, intellects in front of me and I have to treat them as an individual because if I don't I'm betraying my belief about individualism for myself and, and from a leadership point of view, you know, we're always talking about wanting to be participatory in nature and we want to gather the masses to come up with these grand ideas together as a group. You know, I, I, I want to say, let's say 20 years ago, I'm pretty sure the top down theory of leadership has been, at least in the leadership world, uh, destroyed. It doesn't work. Nobody works well like that. Um, you know, the, the, the old still mill type of, you know, I'm your boss, you're going to do it. You know, it. It just doesn't work. And we know as, as leadership educators and those of us that look at leadership research that it's simply not productive. It doesn't work. Um, so that goes back to the same idea of um, you know, your colleagues saying to you, um, you know, they have to be able to take a, take a rule and they have to listen, they have to comply. Well, no, they don't because we've already proven it. That style of leadership doesn't work. We want to hear opinions. We want to hear ideas because the collective nature of, of, of business now and, and education and everything else is to, to, to gather everybody together and make those decisions. So I have to disagree with him as well on that on, that, on a leadership level as well that we don't want people to be complying and, and we shouldn't be demanding compliance. Yeah. So go ahead, Keith, why don't you wrap it up for us, buddy? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Are there situations in which schools need to have rules? Yes, but what is the basis of the rule? Is it convenience for the adult or is it protection empowerment of the children? If it's not, and I believe this firmly, if a rule is not deeply rooted in empowering and protecting kids, then I think we have a responsibility to seriously question the validity of that rule. Um, and that has pretty wide ranging implications. Um, most of the school rules on the books seem to me to be really more about obedience and um, sticking with the system, being a part of what the adults want. I don't, I don't, I think that we have enough evidence, both in terms of child development and research and what the rest of the world is saying, that that's not what we want for our individual thinkers.
there you go. So on fire. Thanks very much, everybody. This is uh, Rob Furman and Keith Reeves. Talk to you next time on The Seditionists.